Next, we have David Weidel, who's an attorney uh, and FDA regulatory expert focused on software as a medical device. As vice chair of SAMD regulation at the Mayo Clinic Center for G Digital Health, he's been leading the development of enterprise-wide infrastructure to enable safe, effective, and ethical realization of FDA-regulated software. He previously was the general counsel and senior VP of quality assurance and regulatory affairs at IDX Technologies, and of course, indeed, was one of the key, key figures in the clearance and deployment of IDXDR. Uh, it is uh, the first autonomous AI diagnostic that was authorized by the FDA. Welcome, David Weidel. Thank you. All right, can you all hear me? Good. Uh, first of all, I, I am realizing as I'm looking over at this table, my bio is twice out of date because IDX is now digital diagnostics and IDXCR is now Luminetics Core. Yes, okay. So acknowledge the team over here that, that uh, I worked with in my, in my past life. So thank you all. This is a, a pleasure to be here. And uh, Deirdre actually ended on a perfect note of positivity. Uh, and I'm kind of going to take that and run with it with respect to the FDA. So one potential advantage we have in healthcare is an existing infrastructure for regulation. And I'm not in my talk going to claim that the FDA process is perfect for machine learning, but I am going to say that it's a really, really fantastic foundation compared to a lot of other fields that we're in. So I'm going to spend my, the, the majority of my time on what is the current FDA process and where are we going. I have no relevant disclosures. And my learning objectives are, are twofold. One, I just want to give a general sense of when machine learning models are subject to FDA regulation, and then give you a quick flyby overview of what sort of expectations in terms of design controls that the FDA would have if you are regulated by the FDA. And again, my, my take home point is the fact that we actually have an existing system that's based off of regulatory science. So these regulatory science principles are used across industries, aeronautics, car, medicine, and these same principles we can apply similarly to machine, machine learning for healthcare. So this is, this is what I do at Mayo Clinic, this middle ground, this black box. Um, we have got a ton of fantastic research at Mayo Clinic, um, many, many machine learning models, algorithms, AI that are, that are coming for us. Most are building these with clinical intentions, right? Most are building these with the intent of trying to better patient care and better physician care. Um, but there's this black box in the middle. And we have all sorts of varied ranges of people that come to us with varied ranges of knowledge when people come to us. Some have a decent understanding of, of design controls and FDA. Others are studying from complete scratch. So we've really been spending the last couple of years building out an entire FDA compliance system at Mayo Clinic. And that's what I'm going to go in here today. So at a really high level, this is generally what, how we think about executing on the process of um, trying to move a, a model, a machine learning model, from research into practice. And if you look over there on the left, we have our research and regulation. That, that's really kind of the iterative space, right? That's where you're, you're looking to build, you're looking to iterate, you're looking to um, publish, potentially, and kind of see how that's doing. And, and, and regulatory bodies like to leave still that flexibility for research, right? So there's not a whole lot of oversight over that left side stage. I did, however, put GMLP, good machine learning practices, because you can't go to the next step without some degree of good machine learning practices already in place. Because once you take that research and you start to go to the next stage and try to start deploying that research, they, um, you're, you're, the, the people who are building that product are gonna ask a lot of questions about your good machine learning practice. So you're gonna wanna be prepared for that. So let's start in this first space. Where is the FDA at right now with respect to kind of that research stage? It's, and, and, and putting the caveat that's a little bit lighter touch than the next stages. So this is a diagram that we actually just created recently that I like to think about um, uh, for a number of reasons. So you see one, two, three, and four, th those are deployment categories uh, is what we call them. So what is the intent of building that model? Are you deploying in stage one, just, just IRB, just research? Maybe publication is your end goal. Um, are you wanting to build a non-medical device, maybe a workflow tool um, in stage two that you deploy? Uh, or are you building a medical device in stage three? 
um, that you're trying to move into full production in the clinical care, which would um, be an FDA-approved model in stage four. And what I'm really trying to show here is we have the ability to create organizational infrastructure that builds on each other, right? So I think that there's this mentality out there that research is over here, regulation is over here, deployment is somewhere in combination between the two things. But I think I, I like to think about it differently in terms of if you've gone through the IRB controls to do your research, you've already started your deployment controls. When you get to stage two, if you have a non-medical device, which by nature is a little bit lower risk, you can add design controls, risk-based design controls to that research and maybe go into deployment mode. But you're still using the artifacts that you've generated in research to execute on your design controls. Same thing with stage three. If you're a medical device, you're adding a little bit more rigor on that, that uh, bar column next to it. Maybe you're adding a quality management system to your research and your design controls to get it into a stage that is then ready for the FDA in stage four. And with FDA, you obviously have a lot more controls because you'd be a commercial market, you have reporting obligations, audit obligations, and so forth. So I like to think about it this way so that we don't do ourselves a disservice by doing work that's not gonna be useful down the road. Okay, one slide on this, but I think it's really important for those who are interested, when am I regulated? When is my model regulated by the FDA? And the FDA has actually a really great policy navigator that you can go into and kind of navigate through the fields. But for simplicity purposes, we just try to create this one diagram. Um, and our approach to it is, is we try to take a least burdensome approach. So our job um, for my team at Mayo Clinic is not to impose regulation, it's to determine when is the risk profile uh, subject to needing FDA regulation. And so the first question we ask is, do you meet the definition of a medical device? Is it intended for the uh, use in the diagnosis, cure, mitigation, treatment, uh, or prevention of a disease or condition? If the answer is no, you're, you're not regulated. So we just, we're done with the analysis, right? So um, uh, that would be like if it's for education purposes only or for research purposes only or certain applications that are more like workflow or administrative in nature. If the answer is yes, then we go to the next category and we look to the 21st Century Cures Act uh, which would help us um, determine whether our function, our software function, our machine learning model, falls into one of the exempt categories. Uh, and those exempt categories are administrative support, the electronic health record itself is not subject to FDA regulation. There's a caveat to that. You can have a medical device model in the electronic health record, so it might be a medical device running inside of Epic, for example, which will be regulated, but uh, running inside the, the, the electronic health record, often we get the question, hey, I'm in the EHR, so I'm not regulated, right? And it doesn't quite work like that. Um, if your model is general health and wellness, those are like our, most of our Apple Watch, kind of you know, tracking nutrition, tracking health, exercise. And then finally, this category of medical device data systems, which is really the transfer. I, I think about it as the pipelines of medical data. None of those are subject directly to FDA regulation. Again, if you're in exempt category, not regulated. Uh, if the answer is no, not, not an exempt category, then we get into a little bit more complex space of clinical decision support. And unfortunately, there's still quite a bit of confusion in this space. Um, there are two types of clinical decision support. There's non-device clinical decision support, which would not be regulated. And then there's device clinical decision support, which would be regulated. I could probably give a whole talk on that nuance. Actually, I do give full talks on that nuance. I'm not going to go into it today because I want to get more into the engineering side of things. Um, but just know that there are four criteria. And if you look at the FDA guidance document, each criteria has like a pretty particular um, analysis for how to determine whether you meet that criteria or not. Number one is if you're processing images, signals, or patterns, you're almost certainly regulated by the FDA. And that's why radiology, cardiology, digital pathology are, are leading a lot of the FDA submissions. It's that one criteria alone. If they're analyzing images, they're likely going to the FDA. Number two, medical information is a little misleading. Everything we do is medical information, but what FDA really is referring to is the general well-known medical information, not these grandiose brand new insights um, that takes, you know, hundreds or, or millions, hundreds of thousands or millions uh, of data points to create. So they give the analogy of medical information as like what we might hear in the hallway when we're talking about a patient. 
Um, it's supportive to the healthcare professional. It's not driving the care, it's supporting the care. So they actually talk, FDA talks about circumstances that would be regulated, um, such as time critical circumstances, and that's where the, the sepsis model comes, comes forward, um, or urgent circumstances where the patient, or where the physician doesn't have the time to make an independent judgment on that result. And then finally, there's, there's an um, expectation of transparency so that the physician can independently analyze the data. If you don't meet any of those categories, you're regulated and going to the FDA, and then you're subject to everything I'm about to talk about. Um, I just want to flag this for, for those who are interested in governance. We do have, um, at Mayo Clinic, we do actually have a thing called the SAMD Review Board that we've stood up, which does this assessment for people. So we've actually created an independent oversight body within Mayo Clinic that um, makes that re regulatory determination and also assesses the risk of that model prior to moving forward. Okay, let's talk a little bit. We're still in that first step of, of um, FDA and good machine learning practices. FDA is incrementally evolving. They know they're incrementally evolving, right? FDA is typically not the leader of telling people how to do it. Typically, industry and academics and people in this room will advise what is that best practice, and then the FDA will incrementally adopt those best practices. But FDA has two things that I want to highlight right now. One is, uh, came out in 2021, and, and it's their principles for good machine learning practice. That's in that wheel there. Very high level, these are principles, right? So they're not very actionable at this point, um, if you're read, to read through that document, but they are principles. They are things that the FDA is starting to ask in the submission process. But I wanna highlight the second one, which came out um, this year, April 2023, which is the start of FDA getting really into like the details of what is good machine learning practice. And that's this guidance for um, predetermined change protocol plans. I don't know if, I, if it's worth going into the whole uh, intent of the guidance other than to say that what FDA is trying to accommodate is upon change management after you've deployed your models, they want to make it easier so that you can pre-specify with the FDA what that change management protocol looks like so you can more iteratively update your model without going back to the FDA. In creating that predetermined change protocol plan, you have to submit that to the FDA in advance with your submission. And if you look on the right side, they've actually started in, in detail to, to highlight what are the kinds of things that they're gonna be looking for in your model training, in your data management, in your performance evaluation. So I really encourage you to check out this guidance document, Appendix A is where they break it all down. You can almost use that as like a guide or a checklist. Hey, if I'm gonna to go to the FDA, what types of machine learning principles are they gonna be asking for or looking for? Okay, now we're outside of research, we're outside of, of, of good machine learning practice, now we're moving into more of the prospect of what does FDA expect in terms of the documents that you're gonna create and submit to the FDA. And I wanna, again, put the assumptions in place. We hopefully already satisfied all of the IRB controls, the, the research controls that the FDA would be looking for. Um, hopefully we've started uh, the good machine learning practices, uh, practices that they would expect. Uh, we've likely locked that model at this stage. So before we move forward, we've likely locked that model down. Um, FDA as far as I know, still hasn't approved anything that's generative or continuously learning uh, in medicine as a medical device. And then, of course, I, I'm not gonna touch on data, privacy, and security. Um, we'll put that as an, as an assumption that will be in place. So now we're moving into development. Like, we've got this research model, we like it, and now we're, we're gonna productize it. We're gonna take it to the FDA. And so this is where, and, and Deirdre talked about this too, um, medicine is in a really great position because we already have environments with lots of multidisciplinary roles these are the types of roles that we would typically see on a team um, to build a model that would, that would go um, through the regulatory controls. And most of these are already available within academic healthcare organizations, and it's just a matter of putting, putting that team together. And before I go into, again, sort of the technical documentation, I wanna highlight one thing in terms of regulatory strategy that you might wanna have um, considered in your process and that is the ability that FDA provides to modularize your product. And so you can imagine, like, if you have your, your model, you built it, and then somebody says, oh, you're a medical device, what is the medical device when you're talking about software? Is it just the function? Is it the function and the display? Is it the function, the display, and the hardware attached to it? Is it the function display hardware, IT? I mean, you can get really far really easily because everything's sort of interrelated. But what this guidance document allows you to do is modularize and really think about it in a risk-based way where you'll say, okay, my medical device function 
is the function that, whatever, analyzes the image, right? But I want to keep outside of my medical device the viewer or the data transfer or the electronic other. You define that up front so you can focus your process, focus your documentation on the higher risk elements. So something you want to keep in mind as you're building out your, the scope of your product and your architecture. Okay, now we're into um, the first stage of uh, documentation that you need to create, which is our design inputs. And again, anybody who uh, has been fortunate enough to be in industry, just building software in industry, these will look really familiar. And, and it's because they really are based off of standard software principles. So you have to document, identify your user needs, product requirements, software requirements. All these are documented in, in, in a documented form. And how you write those are really important because they'll dictate what process you go through to, to build that product. And what can't be missed is the risk management. So at this stage is where we really start the risk management activities. And FDA is entirely risk driven. So I want to do a little breakout of risk management because that's so important in, in how it um, applies to your FDA process. But I also want to highlight that in machine learning, we're often talking about how do we mitigate risks? How do we manage risks? We see a lot of frameworks out there. You know, Deirdre, I mentioned the, the White House Blueprint. There's uh, the Coalition for Health AI, the, the Health AI Partnership. We all talk about risk, but how do we actually go about doing that? Well, there's processes in place with standards, international standards and regulation about how to manage risks, right? We've been doing it with drugs. We've been doing it with devices. Um, FDA expects it for models, so this is it. So um, at a high level, you're really you're identifying the hazards and the harms and then defining the risks based on those hazards and harms, which is the um, uh, risk is defined as the severity of the harm and the likelihood that that harm will occur. And then once you've identified your risks, you go through a process of mitigating those risks, either through inherent safety by design, protective measures, or providing um, information and training. We like to kind of teach this with a shark analogy. Um, maybe a hazard would be like just the shark, the existence of a shark, the harm, might be losing your arm because of that shark. And the risk would be how harmful is it to lose that arm and how likelihood is that to happen? And then the mitigations we might put in place, if it's inherent safety by design, we might just put a net around the swimming area so that they can't even get there in the first place. Uh, protective measures, maybe policy, regulation, right? No bait fishing in that area. And then um, providing information like warning signs. You can apply the same analogy to the process that we would go through if we were building a model. And this is, might be one way you might do it or think about it if we're trying, trying to apply a risk management process to AI. So let's say the hazard, the shark, is bias, right? An incorrect output that is bias. Um, you would then identify, well, what are the situations that might lead to that hazard? In this case, we, we maybe said, well, the patient is processed by the algorithm, but that patient belongs to a demographic that was not represented in the training data set. The harm could be an incorrect diagnosis or progression of disease. And we might have initially identified that the overall risk was unacceptable, red, because of the, the severity and the probability. So we put controls in place. We um, maybe say that the AI system actually does a pre-check and makes sure that any patient that's about to be analyzed uh, is compared with the original training data set to make sure it works for them, and that we also provide transparent information to the physician so that they can make a, an educated decision based on their population, in the numbers, we've actually reduced the risk to green. It's an acceptable level we move forward. So a risk management file will have line after line after line, identifying risks, mitigating. And you can imagine the, the value from a regulatory standpoint of that document that ends up being created of risk control measures and application of those risk control measures. I'll note here you see PRDX um, in, the, in the controls. That leads to another really important thing for the FDA, and it starts all the way at the beginning where it's talking about user needs, product requirements, software requirements, traceability. FDA expects a big traceability matrix to make sure all these things work together. So this is just an example, but you can see how you know, just one user need, you're going to have requirements, you're going to have risk mitigations, you're going to have verification, validation. You're going to want to make sure those all tie together to show that you've actually built what you intended to build. So um, next up is verification and validation, a principle that they're going to expect right, across industry, but it works for us, too, in machine learning. So verification would be um, answering the question, did you build the right product? Right? So they might be testing the software, making sure it's free from bugs, and that it, that it works the way that you intended to work based off of the requirements you set out for yourself. And then validation would be, did you build the right product? 
right? That's the, let's apply this in the intended clinical setting and make sure it actually works as we intended it to work. Validation, huge, like it, it's, it's one of the biggest, both expenses and, and, and parts of the process and expectations for the FDA. Um, and they're gonna look at, at multiple types of validation. They're gonna look at the software validation, right? Making sure it all functions the, the, as intended. They're gonna look at the usability evaluation especially for those products that have a heavily usability component to their risk profile, right? If it matters really a lot how the person who's using that algorithm takes the image and submits it to the image, you're gonna have to prove that they take it right. Um, and then of course there's the, the clinical evaluation and, and the performance evaluation. Finally, uh, two more, um, design transfer is actually a step that they're gonna look for. Just making sure that you, you go through all your production controls, you, you build it, you validate it, it's all working, um, and then uh, you need to make sure that that's actually gonna transfer and still be used in the, in the way that you intended it to be used and still work in the way that you intended it to work after you deploy it, after you get it. So you, you'd create instructions and um, um, define potential system requirements that it needs to exist in, um, of course, cybersecurity, um, uh, maintenance plans, and then um, uh, materials, right? Materials for how to install, how to use, how to operate it effectively and safely. And then finally, we get to our deployment. And FDA, uh, for those of you who are not familiar with it, is not just about documentation. It's mostly about process. So when you get to the deployment, people talk about QMS. It's not just, you know, building. It's, it's a whole governance and, and monitoring and making sure that you have a system, quality management system in place to ensure that you're getting the right information from the field, using that information to update your, pro to, to re-manage risks and update your product as applicable. So you'll see um, requirements for generating, um, uh, receiving feedback complaints and generating files about what you're gonna do with those. Requirements for maintenance, internal audit. Um, if something ever goes wrong, you have to have a process and you have to always be accounting for updates to the regulation as well. So I'm gonna leave you um, also with, these, these are my, if, if, if it's not too nerdy to say, like my five favorite FDA guidance documents. Um, leave you with these. I think that these highlight a lot of what is, um, I'm using right now. I regularly are, am opening these five guidance documents to execute on all the things that I described today. And that's it. Thank you very much.